Savior Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus, your Christian friend. Today is Evangelism Sunday, which means today we focus on God's call to us and the work that God prepares us to do through His grace. Today is Evangelism Sunday, but not because we choose to ignore this theme on all the other Sundays throughout the year. After all, in a way, every Sunday is Evangelism Sunday, because every Sunday we hear God's Word and we are encouraged, uh, we encourage one another to share that Word with those who have not yet heard it. But today does present itself as a special opportunity for us to focus on this one aspect of our Christian life and that which comes from our Christian faith. Today is Evangelism Sunday, so we focus on what God has done for us. And by the Gospel, God has called us to faith. God has called us to, to know Him and to be sure of our salvation. And so, it, at the same time, God has equipped us for a life of works. He has equipped us to serve others with that Gospel. And we've already seen that, or we've already heard it, I should say, as we read our, our scripture lesson for today in our first lesson from 1 Samuel. God calls Samuel to be his servant, and Samuel's response to God, God's call is simple and to the point. He says, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. In other words, he's saying, Lord, I'm ready to hear you, I'm ready to do what you ask me to do. We see the same thing in the gospel. As John records Jesus calling his first disciples, we hear of Philip who was called, and then Philip's response is to go and tell me, come and see. The gospel calls us in the same way. The gospel is that which transforms us, makes us sure of our salvation. The gospel is what creates a response in all of us to declare to him, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And to say to everyone, come and see. God's call for our life is that we might know him and that we might share him. And the most important thing that we know, the most important thing that we have is his gospel because we have been called by the gospel. And because of that, because of this call to us, it's something that we never, ever let go. But also, same time, because of this call to us, it's something that we give to everyone that we can. Today is Evangelism Sunday, so it's all about the gospel. When the Apostle Paul wrote his second letter to that group of Christians in Thessalonica, it was all about the gospel. He begins, as we heard in our sermon, our sermon text that we're meditating on today, the beginning of that is Paul expressing a reason that he has for thankfulness. A reason why he's giving thanks. And he gives thanks to God because of the gospel. God, through the gospel, through the Holy Spirit, chose them. And he called them and he selected them for a life of sanctification. <laughs> it also means that they're ready. See, 2 Thessalonians is a follow-up to 1 Thessalonians, naturally. And in 1 Thessalonians, the theme is often, God is coming. Christ is coming again, so be ready. And in 2 Thessalonians, he gives them that good news, the encouragement that they are ready. And why are they ready? Because of the gospel. Because of God's grace in their life, where God, by his grace, chose them, selected them, made them ready. Think about where they would be without the God, without the good news. Unprepared, unready for God to come again. They would be on a path that would lead them to eternal condemnation. We see how important the gospel is. Where would any of us be without the gospel? Unready, unprepared. None of us would ever be able to stand before God on Judgment Day and say, I'm ready. Take me into your kingdom, Lord. I've done it. I deserve it. I've done everything that I need to do in order to make me worthy of heaven. I've done everything that I need to do in order to avoid punishment of any kind, in order to avoid condemnation. I'm ready. We can't say that. No human being in the history of the world has ever been able to say that to God. We can't say that we're ready 
Because to be ready means to be perfect. To be ready means that we have never once in our lives missed an opportunity to worship. Being ready means that we have always put everything in our lives as a secondary priority to God. Being ready means that we have used His name in perfect prayer, proclamation, and praise 100% of the time. 99.9999% will not do it. Being ready means that we always obey authorities and government. And so you see, it means that we have never in our lives driven over the speed limit by even one mile per hour. Being ready means that we have never had a feeling of hostility or anger towards someone. Never let a lustful thought creep into our minds. Never let a slanderous lie fall from our lips. That's what it means to be ready. I can't say that I'm ready. You can't say that you are ready. Because we all know full well that we have failed to worship. We have withheld our offerings. We have not always put things secondary to God, but instead we've switched it around and made God something that we pay attention to when it's convenient. We have not always used God's name in prayer, proclamation, or praise. We've even gone so far at times to use it as a curse word. Or maybe at other times we have kept his name silent when we had an opportunity to say to someone, come and see. We have not always listened to our parents or people in authority. We've been hurtful toward others. We are not ready. On our own, this is, this is what we have. This is our record. And we are not ready for God to come. We are not ready to say, I deserve to be here. But a few moments ago when I said that no human being in the history of the world has ever been able to say that they are ready, you of course know that that's not entirely true. That there was a human being who at the same time was fully God in every way he could say that he was ready. Because he did everything necessary to be ready. He was perfect. He made himself ready by living a perfect life. And then not only that, he took upon himself and accepted the consequences for not being ready. And not only that, he removed those consequences from our lives completely. And not only that, he also gives us all of this. God the Father sent his Son, Jesus Christ, into the world to do that. To live a perfect life. To become fully obedient. And then to pay for sin by dying on the cross. And then to claim victory over death by rising again. God sent His Son Jesus to do that, and then God says to us, this is all yours. Everything that Jesus did, all of His work, His perfect life, His death, and His resurrection becomes your perfect life. It becomes your payment for sin, and it becomes your triumph over death. God says it's yours. And because God says that, because God is love, He says that, because of that, we are ready. We're ready to stand before God and say, I'm going to come into your kingdom. But you may be ready. And this is what it means to be called by the gospel. This is what it means to be called to faith. To have all of Christ's work attributed to us and to be made ready by his grace. And that's how we know we can have salvation. And so if we know this, and we've been called to faith, it stands to reason then that we would hold on to this as much as possible, that we would always hold on to it and never let it go. That's why Paul encourages his readers. He says to them, so then, brothers and sisters, stand firm and hold to the teachings we pass on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. By God's grace, by the power of the Holy Spirit, with a grip of steel that the Holy Spirit gives, we hold on to this. We hold on to our salvation. We hold on to our readiness to face God. We hold on to that which sustains us. We hold on to it and we never let it go. Now maybe by this point you find yourselves asking, well, what does this have to do with evangelism? What does it have to do with sharing the good news of Christ? The answer simply is everything. <coughs> God gives us His grace. He calls us by the gospel. 
He gives us something that we never let go of. But then that leads us to respond. To respond with a life of godly living, a life of good works, a life of saying thank you to God. And that's what Paul also encourages his readers with. He writes, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and work. Your faith, your call by the gospel is the secure foundation upon which you rest. But it doesn't end there. More naturally follows. A life of good works, a life of good deeds follows. Now, make no mistake, we should never think that our salvation and our security is due in part to our good works. We should never think that the secure foundation upon which we rest is, it, is one part God's gospel and grace and the other part our good works. Salvation does not depend on what we do. But salvation and good works always go hand in hand. You won't find one without the other. And one of the ways that we can express our things, that, that we can carry out this good work, is by sharing the gospel with others. Telling them about Jesus. Giving it to everyone that we can. Now again, the only way that we're able to do this is by His grace. The only way that we can share the gospel is if we first have it in our hands. Think about it. Why would we tell someone of something that we didn't know ourselves. How could we share something that we first didn't have? How could we proclaim something that we didn't already believe? The gospel of God is what equips us. It saves us and then it strengthens us to carry out this good work. And that's what we need. The only way that we can share this message is by knowing what it has done for us. I'm your evangelism pastor. But the only way that I can carry out the work that you have called me to do is by living under the grace of God. By knowing that He has called me by His love. The only way that I can share His good news is by knowing that God loves me. I have sin in my life. There are a handful of members of this congregation who went to high school with me. And they might be able to remember stupid things that I've done or said that really have no place in the life of a called worker, of a minister of the gospel. And if that's true, that they can remember that, there's no way that I'm going to be able to defend myself by saying, well, that was such a long time ago and I've changed since then. Or I'm a good guy now, I've had eight years experience in the ministry, you can listen to me, I deserve the position that I've been put in. I cannot say, listen to me because of who I am. On my own, I am nothing. And on their own, my accomplishments mean nothing. The only thing that I can do is point to Christ in my life. I point to what Christ has done for me. I'm dependent on Him and on His grace. In love, He called me to be His child. In love, He took away my sin. In love, He has equipped me to share that message with love. In love, He has given me security. And this is your security, too. Because you have all done and said stupid things that do not do wrong in the life of any Christian. And your security will not be, you, will not be that you can say, but I've changed, I'm better. Your security is not that you can fix it on your own. Your security rests in God. In what He has made you and how He has changed you, how He has taken you <coughs> in your way. So knowing this, knowing what the good news has done for you, knowing what the call of the gospel has made you, knowing what it has done for me, how could we keep it to ourselves? How could we not share it? Knowing that God sent His only Son to be our Redeemer and our Savior, that is reason enough alone for us to share it and to give it to everyone that we can. And so we do just that. 
I do it not because it's in my job title, and you do it not because I ask you to, but you do it because we are 